Dan Erickson is the creator, writer, and executive producer, and two-time Emmy nominee for Severance on Apple TV+. Plus. I'm Denton Davidson for Gold Derby. Dan, I mentioned your two Emmy nominations, and the series got 14 overall um, at this past ceremony. So I haven't spoken to you since the Emmy nominations came out. So what was that like to just get that sort of avalanche of recognition for this show, your first show? Oh man, it was, it was fantastic. It was so fun. I, I, I got up early, you know, that, that day, which I, which I don't like doing as a rule, but I, I figured this was an okay reason. And I, I had some friends over and I had my friends all, or, or my family on zoom. And so we, you know, we were watching it live as the, as everything happened. And, uh, you know, it was like right before, right before I just had this kind of amused, anxious thought of like, what if we get nothing? <laughs> like, like, how am I gonna like gracefully excuse all these people from my home? You know, if we straight up get nothing, uh, but we didn't get nothing. We got some things, uh, and and so that was incredibly fun and surreal. And you do just you know, in a moment like that, you take a step back and you and you think like, wow, this is this is something I've always dreamed of, and it's just it's very literally happening now. Um. And then, yeah, the, the process, you know, was, was great. I had to, you know, I had to figure out where you buy a tux and all this other stuff that, that was uh, new for me, but uh, eventually got to the actual ceremony and it was, it was just incredible. I was, I was there with my mom uh, and my brother was there too. He wasn't sitting able to sit like right with us, but he was there too. So it was just, uh, you know, it's one of those moments you have to, you, you have to, take a step back every now and again and be like, okay, just, just look at yourself in this moment. This is pretty cool. Was there a memory that stands out? Like, did you meet anyone <laughs> that you were like, I can't believe I just met that person or did you get a flat tire on the way or <laughs> what, what, what's the biggest memory you have of the night? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I met more people than I can name who, who, uh, I've admired for, for years and years. Um, like had had just a, a wonderful conversation with Stephen Colbert at one point, and who who is the nicest person I've ever met, and uh, and uh, just yeah, other people that I've you know the the whole Ted Lasso crew was there uh, on the night. They they had a slightly better night than we did, but you know they they were uh, incredibly gracious and let us party with them. So I got to know a lot of those guys, uh, those people, and. Uh, yeah, it was great. There was no flat tire. Um, I did, I did put up a confusing post because Lizzo posted something where you could see my mom in the background, and so I kind of jokingly I reposted on on Instagram and I was like, "Thanks for this picture of my mom, Lizzo," but I didn't do a good job of explaining what the joke was, and so a lot of people were like, "Wait, does Lizzo know your mom? Like, is Lizzo?" And I was like, "No." So I kind of I kind of accidentally. Uh, you know, uh, made it seem like I was friends with Lizzo, which we've never met, but I would love to someday. Yeah, maybe you can speak that into existence. Um, maybe, maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah, calling out to the universe for it. And you've talked about how this sort of came along later for you. I mean, you've been kind of grinding for, for 10 years and then this, at least in Hollywood and before that you had school and all of that, but um how do you think that affected you as a writer? Like when you, when Ben Stiller calls and, and you're at this point in your life, is it scarier for you because you know how hard it's been and, or is it easier because you're more mature? Or if you were 22, would you be like, have no idea what you're missing? Like, what are your okay. thoughts about that? It's, it's a, it's a great question. And I don't fully like, it's a great question. And I, I don't fully know the answer because, uh, you know, it, it obviously never, it never happened when I was 22 for me. And, and so, uh, you know, it, it may be, I think looking back that I wouldn't have been ready for it. Uh, I, I, I think all of this stuff that happened, you know, like there is, especially a show about, uh, w with this theme that, that Severance has, you know, where so much of it is about, um, you know, being sort of having your identity kind of taken away by life and, and by the, the work system and, and uh, trying to make a living and sort of this feeling of slowly losing who you are. You know, that was something that I, I 
knew of in theory at that when I was 22, but you know, I hadn't, I hadn't spent, I, I look back and I feel like I'm very lucky to have spent, you know, basically two, you know, two decades in the workforce, you know, doing different jobs, working uh, different places in a very wide variety of roles. And I think it uh, creatively, certainly it made me stronger. And, and, and I think too, that, it, that, you know, I like to think I wouldn't have become a total jerk if this had happened at 25, but there is a little more humility that comes with what, when it happens when you're older and you're like, okay, I got, I, I was sort of, I was, cause I had been at the point where I was like, I don't know if this is a viable career for me at this point. Like, you know, I was, I was 36, I think when, when I first met with Ben, maybe older, but wait, no, that's not true. It was, it was younger than that. I, I, I was in my like early to mid thirties when I first met with Ben and it was like, they're, they're, they're for me anyway, being at that point and having never worked in a writer's room and having never really had any indication that I was going to be successful at this, you know, I was starting to ask myself the question of like, okay, do I need to figure something else out? Um, and so I, I went from feeling like, you know, like I was like, okay, if this was going to happen, it would have happened by now to suddenly feeling very, uh, you, you know, very much like I was thrust into this new situation that, that I would, you know, with people who had been doing it for decades. And so suddenly I felt very much like the young person, you know, so it's, 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 it's weird. It messes with your head and you just have to try to not let it uh, make you into a, a whole new, weird, bad person. And you had Ben Stiller in your corner. So, you know, how much did he help sort of guide you through this process? I mean, you have, you must have learned a lot just sort of going through everything with him and, and working through the story and the concept. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Ben comes from a very, you know, a very unique uh, situation himself as, as we all do. And he, uh, you know, he was, he talks about being on set of like, like taking of Pelham one, two, three, and, you know, back in the, I want to say the early seventies, uh, but, you know, he's, so he's, you know, and, and he had family who were in the industry. So he's, he's very much uh, well-versed in this whole situation, this whole industry. And I think he's seen, you know, th there are a lot of people who he has jump-started their career and, and he's watched them have to contend with all the joys and all of the stresses of that. And so, yeah, I mean, he's an incredibly good source. And, and there, are, there are many times where I, I'll sort of turn to him and be like, how, how do you deal with this? Like, this is, this is so, it's so much. And, and he'll always have a really, uh, you know, he just comes from a very informed perspective on stuff like that. So it's great. It's great to have him as a resource. And Severance was sort of, sort of based off kind of a office comedy. Like it's, there's sort of the same ideas in some ways. When you wrote the sort of initial script for that pilot, is was that what you had in mind? Like, were you thinking comedy at the time and then it sort of transitioned into something darker or how did, what was that process? Yeah, I mean, it was always gonna be dark because I, I feel like it's, uh, it's got just a, um, there's a very sad, conceit at the center of it which which came from you, you know a a a a place of sadness that i was in in my life when i when i first wrote it which is uh you know what uh, so many people go through which is that you're you're doing something that you don't that that doesn't make you feel particularly passionate or alive and you you go and you feel like you just deposited 8 hours of your life somewhere for the for the purpose of of just being able to eat and um and so i you know caught myself coming into work one day and just being like i wish i didn't have to experience it like i i i wish the next 8 hours of my life like i i could just not encounter not not experience and uh you know when we have limited time on earth that's kind of a weird thing to catch yourself wishing for so there <clears throat> there was always a sadness at the center of the story. Uh, and, and there was this, this idea of people feeling like they're wasting their lives or people feeling like they never found the thing that they were passionate about. And now they're just sort of running out the clock. Um, and so I, you, you know, 
but that sadness is in the center of of a lot of the office too you know that that same sense sadness is at the center of office space or or any other you know parks and rec like but you know what what so many of those comedies do so well is that they then show the other side of it which is like how can you make it worth it how can how can through the relationships that you build uh in this place how how can it become something that does have meaning for you and i thought there's there was always something beautiful about that in those workplace comedies so it was always going to be it was always going to be funny it was always going to be sad it was going to be the original version i wrote was much more surreal i think it was much more um akin to like uh brazil or or um you know some other terry gilliam thing where there was there was much more heightened reality and stuff that was happening at the office was more sort of zany on its face and i think there was probably more comedy that came into it that way but it was mostly through working with ben that that you know he sort of challenged me he was like you know i think that there's there is you can have that like you can have that madness and it can be this really weird thing but there's also a very human story at the center of this and i think that if you tell it in a slightly more grounded way where you're not having you know big the thing i always say is that there's there's this like weird there was this pair of legs that would be running around the office and you never quite knew what it was uh and he was like you know if you have less stuff like that and focus a little more on just the kind of heartbreaking idea of why would somebody want to disassociate part of their life you can actually probably make something much more resonant so a lot of the the tonal where it landed tonally a lot of that came from ben and you get the call that you're making the show but then you start casting and then we see adam scott come in patricia arquette john Turturro, christopher walken like every new name that's added were you just like wow <laughs> like what was it like to just be on set and see these sort of heavyweights of hollywood reading your lines and you know breathing life into these characters that you created yeah i i mean there's no the, there's no describing it it's it's uh and and as you're sitting there you're trying to sort of wrap your head around it but but um i don't know i mean i i remember the first time that patricia did a scene i remember the first time that john and 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 chris did a did a scene together uh i call him chris cuz we're friends <laughs> uh but you know it's like uh you, you, they come on set and you're almost like I'm like, well, like, whatever, maybe they're going to improvise or something. I'm sure they're not going to actually read the lines I wrote as written. But then it's like, no, they took time and they they took time out of their day and they memorized the lines and they and they came up with, a, you know, a, a, a perspective on the scene and, and they did work on their like, you know, Christopher Walken was doing work in his kitchen on my script. Like, that's still something that is hard for me to wrap my head around that anybody would care about this you know, when I'm not physically there sort of making them <laughs> care about it. Uh, but it's, so it's, it's insane. But at the end of the day, these are all just artists. I mean, and they're people who have, they had to go through their own journey too, of becoming successful and having to deal with that and having to maintain a sense of their integrity and what they got into it for. So it's kind of inspiring to see that and, and see that, that, you know, all these people that I've respected for decades still go through the same they have to ask themselves the same questions and they have to do the same work and they're willing to because they love it and season two is in production and i'm not gonna ask for spoilers and i don't like spoilers anyway i want to see i want to see how things turn out um but we do have news of this expanding cast there's been names attached to season two that there's more actors involved so can we assume that means sort of an expanding world because these people have to go somewhere in the story so <laughs> yeah they're not like, yeah like Merritt Weaver is not replacing Britt Lauer uh, you know, we, we've got we're, we're, she's going to be a new character uh which is going to be great uh but yeah no it's it's uh it's so exciting a and there is an expanding world that that I think is sort of I think is teased and in a way is owed by the way that we ended season one, um, where where we did suddenly uh, get some glimpses of 
what is what is Helly's life on the outside? What is Dylan's life on the outside? What is Irving's life on the outside? Um, and, you know, I don't want to get into sort of how much time we're going to be spending in those various uh, arenas, but um, both on the inside and the outside, I mean, you, you know, we've we've never, we know that there are, that there are, they have stuff going on on the outside that we haven't seen, that we haven't really explored yet. And of course, you know, on the inside the company, there are that it's it's a vast company, and there's there's plenty of stuff that we haven't seen yet. So um, it's expanding on both sides, and that's both the fun and the challenge. Is how do you uh, how do you make it bigger? How do you take a sort of a broader uh, view of it, and and include some new elements that weren't there before, but still keep it keep it feeling like uh, it's centered in the same world on the same story that that you were doing before. What were you a fan of growing up? Like, what were the TV shows or films that you just loved that maybe helped guide you to this career? I was, uh, <laughs> I mean, I was a, I was a Monty Python fan for sure. Um, I remember seeing Holy Grail in middle school and just being like, what is th th this is, this is, changes the whole world. You know, this is, this is totally this is incredible and it's dark and it's and it's weird and it's funny um but i was into that i was into i was very into you, you know stuff that sort of played around with genre like the princess bride where where it was earnest and you could get really excited about it but then it was also would would sort of twist things in a very self-aware way um i was a mel brooks fan i i remember like seeing space balls for the first time and just like utterly flipping my shit <laughs> and uh, uh and and uh yeah I, but then I was also very into I don't know I was a comics kid N not 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 um comic books per se but like Calvin and Hobbes was a huge thing for me the far side Dilbert I loved Dilbert and it's and it's funny because you you, you know that was something in Dilbert is that it would play, it would be very sort of grounded office comedy that would then become incredibly surreal where it's like, there's a, there's a department that's a cave and there's a, you know, whatever else there is. And, and so I was always into that. I was just always into stuff that sort of uh, mashed together weird, uh, seemingly incongruous elements uh, in, in a way where it was funny, but it was also kind of a fantasy and it, it could kind of take you on this, earnest journey into another place and you can throw a hell of a theme party we've got dance parties waffle parties if you were throwing a theme party for the cast and crew of severance <laughs> what would what kind of party would you like to throw i mean i like to think that's what we're doing every day making sequins <laughs> we're just it's one long theme party uh but no i i think i would uh I mean, I'd love to, uh, certainly anytime you, you have goats around, everything is more fun. <laughs> so, you know, a, uh, 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 a party set in that room with the goats, although you don't, that's, that's not a very, there's not much else to do in that room as, as we've seen. Uh, although they have the goat, they have the, those, the feeders in the, the, which I, I assume have like milk or something for the goats, but you could put like vodka or something in those. And I think that could be really fun. Uh, very severance um we can't severance. wait to see what happens with the goats uh dan congratulations on the tremendous success of severance and good luck with everything coming up this next award season and everyone can go check it out on apple tv plus we'll be eagerly awaiting season two and, and that announcement and thanks for stopping by and chatting today with gold derby thank you so much thank you so much this is so fun mm -hmm.